this is Distant Replay. Well, we went back and watched the Team Foxcatcher documentary on Netflix. It's the one on John DuPont, uh, the Dave Schultz murder, and it's all about wrestling and all the events surrounding this period of time in the 80s. And we went back and watched this for this documentary recap edition of Distant Replay. I'm Ben George. He is Mike Noto. Mike, you recommended this one to put on the list. I know this thing has been out, I think, since 2016 on Netflix, but still a, a very solid documentary. Yeah, so when I first got Netflix, this is one of the first documentaries I saw. And as you know, Ben, this sent me into a tailspin where pretty much all I watch now is different true crime and sports documentaries. So this is one of the first ones that got me into the whole genre. Did you go down a wormhole after you watch this, like digging up DuPont and like, because I know wrestling is not a sport that most people are paying attention to and know like the ins and outs and storylines of. So like, did this open up a can of worms for you when you first watched it? When I first watched it, for sure. And this kind of rewatching it sort of brought all that back, you know, because you forget about stuff after you haven't watched something for like five, you know, four, five, six years. Yeah. So yeah, definitely though. Yep. Well, you find us online at distantreplaypodcast.com. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube as well. Please leave a comment, hit the like button, let us know uh, what you want us to watch or what true crime episode you want us to do next. Any any recommendations you have, we take those, put them on a list, and uh, try to knock them out down the road. So we do appreciate everyone that has done that for us. So this documentary, Team Foxcatcher, we're going to kind of kind of go through this and give some thoughts on it. I thought, number one, from the open, because I, I, I think I'd seen the movie Foxcatcher. I don't remember a ton about it. It's one of those that I, I think I watched kind of, you know, passively, either on a plane or just kind of have the background or something at some point, which is this kind of the story, but it's a little bit, I don't think it's as much of the truth. It's got some elements of fiction to that, uh, that Hollywood blockbuster. But I kind of went into this not remembering a ton of it, just a little, very little bit of this. But he kind of catches your attention early on when you see this opening scene of like old film, which they had a lot of great old footage from the, the wrestlers that were living in this compound of them driving up, seeing the house as it was back then. And then flat fast forwarding to now or whenever this documentary filmed and seeing like the house kind of burned down and then all the, the, the plants and leaves and weeds growing up through it. And you kind of had that stark contrast that kind of catches your attention quickly. Yeah, it's like a come full circle kind of, kind of moment in the, right at the beginning of the documentary. The, the, this was, you know, there's some things we'll get to in this documentary that I don't think they did a very good job of, but this was this really sort of encapsulated kind of where the DuPont estate was, you know, like you said, in the 80s with all the home video footage and then now in present day. And sort of now we go on to hear a story of how we got to that point. So let's start with John DuPont because that's, who you know, the, the feature or the focus of this because... He is the the lead character in, in this entire story. I think what's interesting, we know we hear the name DuPont. Obviously, we know the DuPont family, right? I mean, we, we know pretty good about, well, at least we're familiar with the name. We might not know the ins and outs. We might not know the specifics of the family, but we do know that that's a very popular name. I don't think we got enough, like you mentioned this to me, I don't think we got enough detail or background on the DuPont family. I mean, we kind of got a little bit about you know, how he was maybe not loved as much or didn't have a great, you know, his parents didn't have a great upbringing for him. But you don't get a lot of the details about the family itself. Yeah, so I, I've spent some time in like Delaware and outside Philadelphia. So I'm aware of who the DuPonts are and kind of their influence down there. Not not specifically, but it's, an, it's a name that still rings out down there. But yeah, I, if you don't know who the DuPonts are and you're not familiar, this this documentary didn't really do a great job of telling you kind of just how inf they, they went into how influential they were, but not specifically, you know, how they made their money, um, details about the family. Like the only family member we see in this is John DuPont, and he lives at the DuPont estate, which is in Delaware County, uh, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, is he the only family member? Are there others involved? Does anyone else in the family live at the compound? Like a lot of that was unclear when you watch this. Yeah, and he, so he creates this compound, right? Somebody that hasn't seen this documentary yet. It doesn't know the story. He creates the fox catcher farm, which becomes like a, I guess, kind of a home for amateur athletes to kind of train, live, and, and he kind of can take care of everything in terms of expenses so they can really focus on being great at what they're doing. Because, you know, these sports, these amateur sports that he gets involved in, primarily wrestling here, pentathlon events uh, was another thing he was very interested in as well. I think swimming. But, yeah, you don't make a lot of money in these these events, Mike. Right? I mean, it's it's all pure passion play for the most part. You're not you're never gonna have a big endorsement deal. 
unless you are the greatest wrestler of all time. And, you know, for the most part, you kind of do it after college and your 20s, and then, you know, you kind of move on and do whatever else. But he built this thing as a position for them to come in, bring their families, live, we'll take care of you, and let you really just focus in on it. I mean, a pretty unique idea, and one that I'm sure the USA Olympics um, company or de- the USA Olympics, you know, I know wrestling specifically, but anybody in the committee would have been a supporter of. Yeah, so they explain this very well. Basically, you know, all the other countries that were dominating wrestling at the time, or really any Olympic sport, especially wrestling, though, they w- their, their athletes would be solely focused on wrestling. They would have all their financial obligations taken care of. That allowed them to be able to wrestle, you know, more into their 30s, essentially, than a a typical American wrestler who would get to a certain point where they're like, you know, wrestling's great, but I don't really make any money off it. And I really want to raise a family. So I'm going to go raise a family now and stop wrestling. So what that led to is the U.S. kind of falling short in wrestling because of that. And that's where DuPont came in and said with the sport of wrestling specifically, again, like Ben said, he was involved in other sports, most notably swimming. But he focused all his attention on wrestling and basically said, I want to create an environment where our, the athletes can reach their full potential. And how I'm going to do that is I'm going to provide them lodging, food, and also a place to train. And it seemed like a pretty good setup at first. I guess there was no sense of him being crazy at that time, or else I'm sure these families would not have moved there. I think this maybe materialized a little bit into their staying there, but he kind of set him up on this huge farm, right? In Pennsylvania. And you have the main the main mansion, the main house where he lives, but there's like many different aspects of this farm. And I guess the families from from a, from this documentary seem like it was a good thing for everyone, right? To be able to raise your family around other people that are living the same kind of lifestyle. Your kids can have other kids to play with, like kind of raise, you know, the village raising the, the you know the, the children, so to speak. And that really worked out pretty well. But like it doesn't take long before this situation kind of turns into him being paranoid, him being all weird about things. And I don't know, Mike, if you ever had the choice, if you're a really good athlete, just to me, this seems, it just seems odd going to live at somebody's, I know he created like a a farm and this fox catcher kind of uh, safe haven, so to speak, but it still seems odd to me to want to go live on somebody's property and train. I don't know. That's just how I felt about it. I know, obviously in retrospect, it's easy to say that, but I still even think like if that was ever presented to me, I'd be like, "Eh, I don't know about that. Yeah, you know, it's it's one of those things where I don't think it's odd to be provided like training and resources to get better at your sport, but I think it's odd when that person is like so involved in your day to day life. Right. It, it's just it's just strange. It wasn't like an official organization, even though it was named Team Foxcatcher. It was just a guy with a lot of money who decided to put that money towards developing athletes, um, and it was a huge help for the United States uh, for USA Wrestling, obviously. Because now they didn't have to come up with all this money to be able to figure out how to train these athletes. As far as DuPont goes, I think at first he was just like a quirky rich guy. You know right. those like people who have so much money and they've been like sort of separated from real society for so long mm-hmm. that they, they, they're just quirky? I kind of equate it to, have you ever seen The Jinx No. on HBO? That documentary is about Robert Durst, oh, okay. who is, is, is a murderer, right? right. Um, it's what the documentary is about. But he's one of those guys, when you hear him talk, he's just been so separated from reality because of the money he had, you know, that it, it, he doesn't, he can't relate to anyone who's like lived a normal life, you know, and mm-hmm. that's, that's where I got the feeling from John DuPont when I was watching it, sort of similar in his characteristics from that respect. And I agree though, it, it is kind of strange to say, you now we're talking about guys that are like adults here. We're not talking about 18 to 22 year olds. We're talking about guys in their mid, late 20s and even into their uh, mid, late 30s in some cases. And they have their families there with their kids and everything. So like you said, I think initially they were comfortable having their kids there and their families there. And over the course of the years, the situation sort of evolved with DuPont where I think there was some drug use involved. I think it was just general paranoia and the situation develops from there. Yeah, and uh, I don't know, they didn't touch on this documentary as much, but I think like in the movie on this, the subject, Foxcatcher, I feel like they made it out to be more of like DuPont was much closer with these people that he was bringing in, like had a, a deeper affection for them than just like 
trying to make them really good at what they do and, and trying to help train and, and, and mentor them. It was like a little bit deeper. Now, I, I didn't get that sense in this documentary if that was the case. So I don't know if that was more of a Hollywood angle, but it kind of felt that way. Like you have a little element of, of it being kind of creepy with the way he's on always around, the way he's kind of he's sparring with these guys right on the wrestling mat. I mean, it's not when you have a 50 or 60 year old man or 50, I guess he was in his late 40s, early 50s wrestling with these guys that are in shape in their prime in their 20s right there's you're not really getting better by by sparring with a guy like dupont it, it, but he i'm sure he's one of those guys gonna throw himself on the mat like hey let's let me help you out a little bit here and, and it just you kind of got this sense of like it just feels very uncomfortable watching him spar with those guys yeah he wants to be one of the guys right I mean, that's really what this all boiled down to in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, so now he's paying for them all to live there, right? So if the guy wants to spar with them, what are they going to say? right. You know, like, hey, hey, no, uh, you know, but make sure you uh, have my dinner ready tonight. You know, like, (laughs) so it's one of those things where they, they, these athletes, though, they all played into it. I mean, they all were very well aware that, hey, to keep this thing going, we need to keep John happy. And one of the ways they kept him happy was making him feel like he was one of the guys going to the main house and hanging out with him. They went through how like they went through different shifts, like to go hang out with him at different times of the day and night. So they realized it was a part of the deal, whether DuPont realized, hey, these guys are only really acting like they're my friends because, you know, because of what I'm providing for them, whether he fully realized that I'm not, I wasn't really clear on, but it seemed like he did develop some actual friendships with some of the guys. Yeah, it felt, I mean, it seemed like that, at least from from the the conversations that we got to see on here. And they did they do it. They were able to, to talk to most of the wrestlers that were there, living on his property, which kind of gave you some pretty good insight into things. But there was just some odd behaviors throughout this. So a few of the things, obviously, they they highlighted that were very interesting, that were kind of that were very odd. So the first one, I, I think that that made me be like, what is this? The the master, I think they called it the master league or the master division of wrestling, where it was where it was guys that were, I don't know what the lo- the lowest age was, but I would assume like 50 and up would actually go around and compete. That That's just really, it was really weird seeing these these wrestling matches between these older guys. And the fact that he had some of them like fixed to where these guys would take a fall essentially, like it was like the early days of WW, uh, WWF, uh, so to speak. But like there were people watching these events and, and like it was an actual organized wrestling match that took place between these 50 year old men. What, what, what was that Mike? Uh, you know, it was, it was funny because like Ben said, like they're like, or like staged wrestling matches. So when you think of staged wrestling matches, you don't think of Greco Roman style wrestling. You think of wrestling, wrestling, like mm-hmm. WWE type wrestling, but they would have these staged matches where like people would be cheering for John DuPont. And you know, when he would win though, like he would win, he'd pin the guy. And then as the guy was walking off, they told stories of like that guy getting paid off right when he got off the mat. You know what I mean? Yeah. With the money that he got paid for taking the fall. I thought that was pretty funny. (laughs) That is just so bizarre to me because like Ben said, there's a crowd there cheering for him. Like they're playing it up to like the nth degree here. Yeah. And he he basically created this. It kind of reminded me of, you know, those uh, parents whose kids can't make like the normal AAU team. So they create one. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Like, that's sort of what and John DuPont did. Like, he created his own wrestling league that he could, you know, manipulate to win. Right. And uh, it was so funny, Ben, when they were talking about, you know, wrestling and people wrestling in their 50s that typically they don't do it because, like, they're in their 50s. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and just describing that whole aspect of it I thought was really funny. And But, yeah, that is – when that's, like, not even close to being the most bizarre behavior that, that, you're, that you conduct yourself in mm-hmm. – you know this documentary was just full of bizarre behavior. Yeah, that was one. The other, the other really weird event, and, and like he's got, he's he's turning very paranoid during a lot of the, like early '90s, right, where he thinks he's seeing people on his property. He thinks people are kind of coming after him. But the the whole event with the the driving the car into the the lake twice, like where he he drove his car into a lake on the property, got a rental or got a loaner car from Buick or whatever he was driving. And put somebody got somebody in the car with him and did it again. Like, how does that? Like, that, why was there, there more made out of that? You're seeing just like, this is what I got the feeling Ben is. He's 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 conducting himself in a very bizarre way, right? Mm-hmm. But I think the people that live there and the people that were close to him, the people, the athletes, they all had such a stake in like keeping this thing going that if they commit him to a hospital or if they get him help, 
you know, the money may be cut off. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I thought that kind of played a factor in all this that, Hey, look, let's just prop him up. Let's see if we can get him some, some help in the form of like, you know, medicine or whatever. Let's keep his mood good so we can get to the point where we kind of achieve our goals. Um, and I thought that played a lot into it because that's the only real explanation for letting this behavior go on as long as everyone did. Very odd. The, 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 just to see that, like to that happen, like to, to not, you know, not only just once it's a weird thing to, to drive off into a lake, but to, to have it happen twice and nobody kind of questioned what's going on here a little bit more um, was pretty weird. The other thing that was going on is he had this connection with the police. Like he, he was able to use his money and his power to build these relationships. And so they would come out and shoot on the property and train a little bit on the property. And because of that, he built these relationships and kind of had himself protected by the local cops. Yeah, they had a, he had a hunting lodge on the property, on his estate, and the cops would t- the cops were in this in this piece, and they would they would go through how they used to go there for like a yearly outing, and they were all very close to John, and that definitely seemed to me like it influenced how they handled situations with him. Uh, this is a very well connected guy. I mean, there's pictures of him with Ronald Reagan, there uh, videos I should say videos of him with Ronald Reagan with the older uh, George Bush. Um, so he's a very, very well connected guy. And I think that along with the financial, you know, the financial donations and also the financial sort of, uh, support he gave these athletes, again, it all contributed to what happened here. I'm not saying it was the cause. I'm not saying it was anyone specific's fault, but a lot of people turned a blind eye and it just goes to show like when there's money involved, people will turn a blind eye to a lot of stuff. Yeah. They always have always will. So the other main character of this documentary is Dave Schultz, the very, very talented wrestler. He was an Olympic and world champion freestyle wrestler, seven-time medalist in the world and Olympic gold medalist. Um, they, he was able to get get Dave to come to the farm and help train and help train him, which is also another weird aspect of this whole thing. When you see like this, this you see Dupont wrestling and he's over there like rubbing his arms down and, and cooling him down. But, but that's what, that's what John wanted. He wanted him to train and, and they kind of built a bit of a relationship here, but things start to go sour with this, Mike. Like, I, I don't know exactly if it's a paranoia or what it was, you know, but that he starts kind of having this falling out with everybody and it doesn't take long, like for, for him to just Dupont for, for him to go off and like, just start coming after these guys that are, they're living there. Like, what what do you think that that switch was that flipped? You know, first of all, with Schultz is, um, you know, he gave legitimacy to that to living at that compound. Like they were like, oh, Dave Schultz is living there, or Dave Schultz is going to be involved. That led other people to get involved, right? So that's first. I really could. They didn't really do a great job in this of telling you what the switch was for John Dupont. It seemed like it was just a gradual decline into like insanity, pretty much. Mm-hmm is the way they depicted it. I can't remember them discussing any watershed moment where like a switch flipped and he all of a sudden was, you know, a complete loony bin. Um, it was sort of seemed like a gradual decline Yeah. that all those people close to him thought they could sort of snap him out of. Um, and they went through how that Dave Schultz was like his actual friend, like actually genuinely looked out for him, you know, more so than maybe some of the other guys at the camp at the uh, compound who were just in it for, hey, look, I'm getting a free place to stay, free place to train. And other than that, I don't want to deal with John that much. But he actually went the extra mile to try to help him. Yeah. And, you know, he just, some of the behavior he exhibited, I mean, it, it was a, it was a steep decline. And what about the, the part, Ben, where he banned anything black from the premises? Yeah. That was... There's a crazy. lot of weird things we could list like that. Yeah, that's one oh. of them. Like it's easy to forget about some of the things that happen in this that that are just very odd. Yeah, he like literally. So just so, so for everyone who hasn't seen it, he banned everything black from the property, including like his black horses that he had. He banned those, and in a wild move, he banned like he started to ban all the black wrestlers that were there. Yeah, and we're talking about a guy who was like a, already an Olympic champion, and. When John like got confronted, they were like, John, you're going to seem like you're a racist here by, by telling all the black members to sort of leave the compound. Yeah. He's like, no, I'm not racist. Like He sort of scoffed off. He's just like, I just don't want anything black here. <laughs> like That to me where I was like, man, this guy is like, he's, he's, that should have been the red flag to me. They had to go tell these guys, hey, you need to leave because you're black. Yeah. Like, How did that not get more attention from everywhere? 
Um, it just shows you how different things were, you know, 30 years ago. And having to tell these guys, hey, you need to leave because of that. Just mm -hmm. wild, man. Like that, that to me should have been the moment where we're like, all right, maybe it's time to get out of here. The other weird thing was too, like his relationship with the Bulgarian wrestler, Valentin Dimitrov, who's in this as well, where he just like started like kind of claiming Bulgarian. Um, yeah. Yeah. Lineage. Lineage. Right. And, and like, he's wearing a Bulgarian jacket and like, and everybody's like, we know where the, where the DuPont families come from. Like you, if anybody can't cover up their background, it's you, but, but here you are. Yeah. But everything he did was like, he was in his own world. One of the most famous French families ever in the history of being French. Hmm. And he's trying to sell that he has Bulgarian lineage. He even started like supporting the Bulgarian national team. Yeah. With like resources, just so crazy. And he became jealous of the relationship between the Bulgarian wrestler and Dave Schultz, too. So right. that was a part of it, also. Yeah, it was. But he, you know, there's some footage in this documentary of him like out shooting guns. And I'm surprised he never shot himself. Like he saw a couple of the, 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 I don't remember what kind of gun it was. He's like on his back. It looked like he was on his back porch, by the way, shooting out. And he, he would, he would like shoot out of a car, like driving through his property, like very weird behaviors, right? But he'd shoot sometimes and, and like it, I was, I really thought it was going to, he was going to shoot himself or just shoot somebody, but he just, you know, this, this kind of behavior kept amping up. And so that, that footage is really interesting. A couple of other footage that I thought was really interesting was like when he was on the plane and a couple of, a couple of shots they had, and they had some really good candid footage. Went on the plane flying to one of the world championships, another in a car driving to maybe, I think another event with some other, with his wrestlers in there. And he talks about killing like that's, you know, and, and, and I know we all kind of say, Oh, we're going to kill him. Right. They're going to destroy him. But you kind of got that, like the look in his eyes when he's saying that. You, you kind of see it's like a little something, something a little bit darker. Yeah, th this is what reminded me him me of the uh, Robert Durst. It's yeah. just the way he talks about really kind of heavy topics and kind of like an off putting kind of like matter of fact kind of way. That stuff's just like straight up chilling, you know. And and, and it's just there was a lot of warning signs. Yeah, well, let's talk about the actual murder, Mike. So, who who was it in the car with him? With DuPont that day? I can't remember who the guy was. Yeah. I don't it remember. was a guy who wasn't in the documentary that much. Right. But he, so this whole, this whole, everything's kind of unraveling at this point. He's already kind of kicked another guy out. Forget about the, the black athletes. And then there's another guy that was, that he had parked a U-Haul out and was trying to get him to move out for a while. Even went in and put a gun in his chest. Like, hey, you got to get out of here. So like these things are all kind of uh, snowballing to this moment where it's like a day where they're outside him and his family, Dave Schultz and his family are outside just, I think, playing whatever in the snow, just, uh, you know, spending time together. And, like, this guy that was in the car with DuPont just describes it as, like, he picked him up, got in, went around to see Dave, and then just out of the blue, just out of nowhere, just pulls a gun, sticks out the window, and shoots the guy. Kills him right in front of his wife. I don't know that the kids were right there to see. I guess they weren't, because I think they talked about breaking the news to them later on that night. But just a really cold, I mean... It, you could tell he's obviously got something very, very wrong mentally, but just to do this out of nowhere and really nobody saw anything that's coming because of the relationship, while it might have been a little dicey at times, never, and I don't think anybody could see this coming, but it's a pretty uh, pretty tough thing to hear, just the way how cold-blooded it was. Cold-blooded and just like, I don't want to, I don't know if random's the right word, but just yeah. like stunning, you know? Yeah. Like literally just see someone, stick a gun out the window and shoot him. Boom. Done. That quick. And it was especially sad because, you know, this guy, Dave Schultz, he, he, when other people were like, Hey, John's crazy. John's this, John's that he always told people, Hey, look, I, I, I can get John to calm down. I know John, I'll talk to him. Like he, he stood up for John, you know, I, he stood up for John DuPont, you know? So it, it, from that perspective too, when you, when you know kind of the history behind it, it makes it even rougher than his wife finding him. His wife is the one who was bringing us around the estate in present day. Also, yeah. that we mentioned yeah. at the beginning, um, his kids were in this as well. I just overall, just like such a terrible, all around, such a terrible story. And then there's a standoff. So he just basically shoots the guy, then goes back to his house, drops him off, and is like tells the guy to drive him, "Hey, I'm gonna, the cops gonna be here." So he basically holds up. But you hear the the, the audio, the the calls from the police to him. And again, remember the relationship they already have with the cops. Um, they kind of looked out for him for a while and kind of built this relationship with him, very friendly, cordial relationship. And he's on the phone talking about how you could tell he's, he's off his rocker talking about it's a holy place. Like he's the one in charge. You know, I'm not coming out. And the fact that he thought that he had so much control in this situation where they went and shut his, this heat off because this thing had been dragging on and the cops weren't, it didn't seem like making enough effort to get him out of there. 
and they basically turned the, turned the heat off, and he was like, hey, can I go down and check on this since y'all can't see anybody in here? The guy's like, yeah, you can go ahead. You can leave the house. Nothing's going to happen. But the fact that he thought he could just walk out of his house in the middle of a hostage situation and go down and check on the heat and, like, nothing was going to happen just shows you how out of touch he was and how protected he thought he was. Yeah, you, you, you just hit it. It's a combination of both. Like, hey, I have a great relationship with the cops. They won't do anything to me. And also, like, I just live in this alternate reality where I literally just killed someone. And, and I, I think other people are going to prioritize my comfort from a heating perspective more than, like, someone losing their life. Yeah. <laughs> like, just, like, just, you know, the word bizarre is coming up a lot in this, po- in this episode. But definitely watch it. Because the home foot, the home video footage, and the, the footage of the call that Ben just mentioned, is really what makes this documentary worth watching. Um, there's some gaps in the story, like we we've mentioned that are unclear, but this home footage and this this footage of these calls, like, are really really well done. And they have the trial and the the guilty verdict. I mean, the trial. I mean, the defense made sense, right? Crazy insanity, and the fact that I'm surprised, I, like, legitimately was shocked that he didn't get off, Mike, based on. A, his behavior leading up to this, right? There's plenty there to to make the case that he went crazy. And then the fact that they did a great job of him letting himself go and growing out the beard, the hair, and he looked like he had lost a ton of weight, looked very, very unhealthy. And you know, they sold it by bringing him in in a, you know, in a wheelchair and talked about how he just evolved over time. Like things got worse and worse. Thought that would weigh on the jury. And they, did, they talked about it a while. And... Um, you know, eventually they did decide that he was guilty. And I was, I was, I truthfully like that, that verdict, I know we already know what it was, but I'm surprised that he did not get off with insanity. Yeah. So he, you know, I think you make a good case for insanity and I am, and given his status, you're right. I was shocked that he actually, you know, bared the brunt of a full punishment Yeah. Uh, for the, mur- for the murder. And, I'm not, and I believe he should bear the brunt of the full, you know, right. full extent for the murder, just to be clear. But we see we we go through a lot of cases in our true crime sports uh, series where the punish the the crime that's committed the punishment that people get sometimes doesn't seem like it correlates, and uh, in this case, especially when the person's from means, you know, and no one that we've covered is from more means than John Dupont, and uh, yeah, it was surprising to see from that perspective for sure. Yeah, as much money as he threw behind it is uh you know his defense. I'm surprised he wasn't able to get us a, a lesser verdict, but he ends up dying in prison at 72. And, you know, they, they talked to his kids at this point, which, you know, I, I applaud them for, you know, having the courage to sit down and actually talk about this. I'm sure it's a very tough thing because they were probably just old enough to kind of know what was going on. Probably don't remember everything, but definitely old enough to remember every, like what happened and, and how it unfolded that night. Uh, but I thought his daughter's reaction was pretty interesting. And she said that like, she felt bad for DuPont. Because nobody ever loved the guy. And like now, you know, her father, when her father died, everybody was mourning and celebrating his life. But, you know, when when DuPont died, you know, by himself alone, everybody there was celebrating the fact that he actually died. And I thought that was very interesting that that was her that was her perspective on everything now. Yeah. And it's it's one of those things where we're always amazed at least one time when we're doing a true crime episode or, or a documentary like this, like the perspective that people can have on events that are most affected by those events. Mm-hmm. And I think that was a good example of it in this one. Yeah. And they, so they had both children was pretty cool to see. And um, it finishes off with a really just a heartbreaking scene of the family, you know, when they were that their happiest essentially with the dog and the two kids and Dave on the hammock together and kids loving all over their father. And I'm assuming mom was, was filming it, but yeah, just another kind of just a just a really great scene to finish off the documentary with. And, you know, we come to find out, you know, that all those athletes ended up leaving right pretty quickly after. And, and Dave's wife, Nancy was pushing a lot of that. And uh, I think they set up another foundation and other things were done in Dave's memory down the road. And I didn't realize Mike, this happened like six months before the Olympics in Atlanta. Did you realize that? Um, yeah. Cause they mentioned how he was sticking it out there. Dave Schultz was until you know, the Olympic trials and the Olympic games. Yeah. So it did make reference. That's the only reason why I knew. I just, you know I just don't remember that story at all. Right. When it was happening. No, no, I don't either. And, 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 you know, unfortunately wrestling is not a really highly, you know, that's a reason why DuPont started what he did at, at the, at his compound is, you know, wrestling is not a really well followed sport, you know, mm-hmm. it, it's a niche and I know people that are really into it and I'm not, I don't want the wrestling people to get all over me here, but 
um, you know, it's not on everyone's radar. So what were the biggest things you think this documentary is missing? More background on sort of what was John DuPont's life like before he, um, before he started sponsoring athletes at his compound. Yeah. Like we got no, like, did he work in the family business? Was he sort of the outcast? Was there other members of the DuPont family in that lineage, like still alive at this point? Uh, where were they? And other than that, I think you could, you know, you could get into like his relationship with the cops and how that, how that influenced things a little bit more. But then you're talking about like a two hour documentary, you know? Yeah. But I think that was mainly, mainly what they, you know, develop less on the home video footage and maybe more on like, you know, a little bit of background of, of, of the family and, and John's life beforehand. I will say though that that home footage was great. And always, it always, it always, it always, it always shocks me at how much home footage is out there from these, these events, or like these stories. Yeah, who that gave that to them? Like, was that all Dave's family tape? I don't think it was. A lot of that okay. stuff seemed like personal John Dupont stuff. Did they find it when they, you know, when they went through his estate? Like, who knows how they found that stuff, or who gives it to them? Yeah, no clue. But it was all really, really good. So, overall, documentary was, was strong. It's a, it's a pretty, pretty wild story. Um, one that kind of ties into our Olympics. We've been doing quite a bit here, leading into the twenty twenty one. Olympics in Tokyo, which is about to start up, and uh, definitely would recommend this documentary on Netflix. I mean, where where was this one ranked for you, Mike? Is this one of the better ones you've seen? Kind of middle of the road. Where, where do you put? Where do you peg it? As far as a sports documentary, uh, it's in probably the top quarter I've seen. As far as like a true crime one, it's like middle of the road. Okay, because it kind of combines sports and true crime. Right, definitely. Um, so kind of middle middle of the road. Okay. Worth watching for sure. Yeah, fair enough. It's on Netflix. If you haven't seen it yet, you can find it there, and uh, we would recommend that. Again, came out in 2016, tells the story of John DuPont and the murder of wrestler Dave Schultz. We'll close it out on that note. If you haven't subscribed or follow us, please do so. Whatever podcasting app you choose to listen on, you'll find us there, Twitter, Instagram, and online at distantreplaypodcast.com, as well as our YouTube channel. Please give that a subscribe when you have a second. Hit the like button. Leave us a comment. Tell us what you thought about this documentary or what you think about DuPont in general in this whole story we'd love to hear from you mike enjoyed this one yeah same here ben like subscribe rate review and until next time